Hi, this is Mark Arnold with another Fun Ideas podcast. And on today's show, we have someone who I know is a cartoonist, but apparently she's also a musician and has other things about her illustrious career that we hopefully will talk about in the next hour or so. And this is Mary Fleener. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. So um, I usually start a lot of these shows basically, and since I know you as a uh, like a comic book or cartoon artist, um, mostly. Uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in that part of your career. I was born in LA, Los Angeles, California, and mm -hmm. my mother was an artist. So I inherited a lot of the art DNA from her and did art. That's what I did as a kid. That's all I ever wanted to do as a kid. And in fact, the new book that I'm working on, The Happy Hour, I'm talking about this fire that I had in me that um, finally I got it together at age 33 and, and applied myself, as I always tell you, you should. But it I was a late bloomer and I started, you know, I did art in high school, printmaking college, you know, printmaking major in college. And I dropped out because uh, it was soul crushing and I wanted to play music. And I just said, I don't do art anymore. I want to be a musician, which is also what this book is about. It's kind of about, you know, following your dream. And they say you should do that. Well, yeah, you should. And I wish I'd done it earlier. So about 1983 or 84, a late friend of mine, a writer named Don Waller, told me about an article that Matt Graney had written in the LA Weekly about the new comics. Mm -hmm. The new kind of underground comics, not the Zap comics, not arcade, but this whole new new movement uh, pretty much started by the Hernandez brothers with Love and Rockets. And the first paragraph went something like this. Were you the kid in school that drew during lessons? And then when the teacher looked at you, you'd crumble off the paper and shove it to the back of the desk. And I go, that's me. <laughs> so I read this article and I just went, oh my God, this, I, I just, my head exploded. And he had the addresses of Dennis Warden who was doing Slur Magazine Teen Angel, which was a zine about the, the, the new gang thing that was happening. It was, nobody knew what was going on, but there were gangs all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. Raw Magazine and Robert Crumb and the address for a weirdo. Oh. So I, I wrote all of them. Mm -hmm. And um, Dennis and I hit it off right away. And we're still good friends to this day. And uh, I remember Crumb sending me a copy of Weirdo number 10 and I remember opening it up at the mailbox and just like skipping up the street going, oh, my God, Robert Crumb wrote me. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> and uh, I went in there and I said, Paul, look, here's Weirdo. I'm going to be in Weirdo. And he goes, how do you know that? I go, I just am. <laughs> Don't argue with me. And so I realized a couple of things. I didn't want to do superheroes. There was a glut. The slots were filled. Um, I always thought Sam Phillips from um, Sun Records was very wise. He said, the most important thing to be is original. So I started doing mini comics because I heard about the new mini comic thing and guys like Pete Bag, he would review a few mini comics in Weirdo. And then uh, there was Fact Sheet 5, which had hundreds of listings, Maxima Rock and Roll, Flipside, all the music magazines would review all the bands and the zines and the comics. So there was a small little group of people doing this, but we were sticking together. And I did my first solo comic hoodoo, which was adaptations of Zora Neale Hurston stories. And Ray Zone published it. And um, it was only 28 pages, but that was all I could do at the time. I was just, you know, I, I was ordering new I was I was self self-teaching myself, you know, even though I had a fine art background. I always wanted to do comics, but I was trying to get away from the, the influence of Robert Crumb because, you know, when I grew up in high school, everybody doodled Mr. Natural and, and Rick Griffin, Murph the Surf. So it was a real hard monkey to kick, you know, to try to get rid of that underground style and do something new. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I got started. And anthologies, a lot of anthologies like Weirdo and Rip Off Press, Buzzard, uh, Prime Cuts. Um, uh, God, there were so many sub, what was that, sub trip, sub, 
Oh, uh, bumble puppy or something. There, oh, there, centrifugal there. bumble puppy. Yeah, yeah. Everything. everything had to have eight syllables in the title, like the teenage preteen dirty jean <laughs> kung fu kangaroos and the <laughs> teenage mutant ninja turtles and all that. Anyway, in the 80s, we were considered people that couldn't draw. Mm. We had nothing to say. Guys like uh, Don Thompson from uh, the, he was Review Comics. He, he loathed us. <laughs> All of us alternative people were just, you know, yeah, what are you doing? You don't draw like Jack Kirby. Yeah. And um, and so a lot of us, I, I for one, me too, I used to badmouth Jack Kirby. No more. <laughs> no more. No more. And I recently read about four of Will Eisner's books, and he was, what a, what a visionary. So I'm sort of catching up from that prejudice. But it was, you know, it was like kind of like us against the fam. <laughs> and uh, so that's. That's kind of how I got started. I just did it on my own, hmm. DIY, as they say. Now, how I first heard about you was three different ways. The first you already mentioned is Weirdo. And then years ago, I interviewed you briefly for this long article for Back Issue Magazine about Weirdo. And I, I don't know if you did, but everybody else was like, isn't there a book coming out by John Cook? What happened to that? You know, and then it finally did come out. But I had to tell people I'm doing my article independently of that, you know. But yeah. Anyway, but uh, and then the uh, the second way is our mutual friend Lee Hester, who's yeah. one who he's bugged me for every episode. He said, You should get Mary Fleener on the show. And I go, <laughs> I don't know her that well. And then after I'm looking at things, I go, I think I do actually. It's just that I just didn't always put two and two together. And then the third way I, I knew about you originally is uh, you did a brief cleaner comics format draining when he did that short lived Zongo label when he was doing Bongo. And uh, so that's kind of like my introduction to your work. But uh, Lee was saying, oh, you should read your Slut Burger and things. Like that. mm -hmm. That's really funny. And I, I did take a look at those and I go, yeah, that's my type of material. It, it is surprising, but I think it might be because it, you said you, you got into it kind of late that you would have been perfect for like the early lampoon or something like that, you know, something like that, you know, but. Well, know. <laughs> I, I remember picking up national lampoon and just, I, the, the, the art was really good. I mean, it was really <laughs> good. Like my friend Millie wanted me to be in the new mad. And I said, I am not worthy. I, I don't have that style like Bob Fingerman and, and um, um, Peter Cooper, you know, well, of course, Spy vs. Spy is, has its own thing. Yeah. But I sort of, when I try to conform and do comics on demand, I usually fall on my face. Mm -hmm. I'm really better <laughs> off on my own, plodding along and waiting for inspiration to strike. And yeah. um, I'm more, somebody talked, said it was esoteric, and I think they're right. When I've tried to be funny, um, I, I'm not really that much of a gag meister. Mm -hmm. And for a while there, I was trying to do political cartoons for a local paper here, editorial things for local political issues. Yeah. And I was successful 60% of the time. <laughs> I was going to ask Which you was, about that, but yeah. What was that yeah, yeah. called? Uh, it had a name and I wrote it down here. Uh, oh, the less you know, the better you feel. Is that what you the called it? The less you know, the better you feel. Okay. <laughs> and then the other one was just called Maryland. Okay. <laughs> And yeah. the Maryland, I, I started getting into sort of the Ripley's Believe It or Not territory where you like, uh, you walk down the street and keep your eyes open. You never know what's going to happen. Right. You know, funny little things can happen when you least expect it. And most people just have blinders on and go from point A to point B. And I'm such a freak magnet that I never lacked for material when I was doing things just like, like walking. I went to the beach one day. I'm walking along and this guy comes up and he goes, I want to give you this shell. And I go, really? And he goes, yeah, a little girl gave it to me on the beach. And she said, you have a wonderful day. And he goes, isn't that great? He goes, so I'm going to give you this shell. And I'm like going, I love this. <laughs> Some guy I don't know. And he gave me the shell and he walked away singing. And I'm like, God, this is cool. You know, so you do a story about something like that. It, telling a common story in an uncommon way is kind mm -hmm. of, where I'm at and uh anyway Lee Hester's terrific he tried doing uh, a comic convention one year um I think it was in the 90s yeah 
and it was up in San Jose. Did you go to that? I didn't. I didn't know Lee well enough then. Okay. I mean, I, because I, I grew up in the San Jose area, and he was more oh. Palo Alto at that time. And, mm -hmm. you know, as a kid and a teenager, uh, Palo Alto could have been on the moon almost. It's like, it's, it's yeah. a bit of a yeah. drive when I you don't drive, that. you know? Yeah. I mean, later, you know, when I got to be an adult, yeah, I would go to his shop, you know, pretty frequently. And then when he moved to Mountain View years later, you know, I went all the time and then I started, we, we actually got to be close friends and I worked with him on shows and you know, I just, I came back down to California about a month ago for the first time in about two years, and we went out to eat and stuff like that, so and catch up. And he was actually the one who gave me the kick, not only to get you on this show, but also to do a podcast in the first place. I was like, I don't have time to do a podcast. And he goes, but you're always interviewing people. And I go, well, that's true. It's for my books. But, and then I go, hmm, I could do double duty on this stuff, you know? <laughs> so... Yeah, you know, it's fun. I mean, I get to meet people like yourself, you know, even if I don't use this for an article or anything, it's great because I get to hear about, you know, what it's like. Uh, where'd you go? No. Uh, what I it's like being a cartoonist. I can't was interrupting me. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, what it's like being a cartoonist. And, you know, we are going to talk about uh, being a musician too, which I guess this is a good segue since I mentioned it. So you have a group that you call, that I said that I found out is called the Wigbillies. Is that the only band or is that your current band that you've been in? Well, it's basically just my husband and I now. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like, you know, Steve and Edie. Um, we had a band in, in about 2001. Mm -hmm. It was sort of like our uh, midlife crisis, you might say. And we got together with a guitar player that Paul and I had known when we lived in LA. And uh, we tried playing with him back in the late 80s, but he had to grow up a little bit. <laughs> so he came back on the scene and then I met a woman drummer uh, from a all gal group that I was briefly playing with and I stole her away. <laughs> Best drummer I've ever played with. And we had a band called the Wig Titans. Hmm. Don't ask me. We had a list of wacky names like, you know, Clear Spot, Dad, Too Beef Heart, Too Beef Heart, Wig Titans. We go, yeah, that's wacky. We just, what does it mean? I don't know. <laughs> and we played, God, we, for some reason, there were all these bars around here and they liked us because we did original stuff and we played things like Old Fleetwood Mac and, you know, rock. We were rockers. Uh, hmm. our, our, we pretty much kind of a combination between Rock Pile and Dr. Feelgood. That's in mm. a little Chuck Berry thrown in. Old school rock, because right. that's what I like. Yeah. And um, and Paul, my husband Paul's an excellent guitar player and the other guy was a good guitar player. So we just did, we were gigging all the time, but it was crazy because we were in our fifties and it would take us three days to recuperate, you know, 9.30, 9.30 to 1.30 in the morning. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. and uh and what was really neat is a lot of the bars were like within a mile of our house mm -hmm. so we had all these secret routes to get home so we wouldn't get you know any duis or anything so anyway we made enough money to pay for two cds mm -hmm. and when we did them we did a lot of the songs in one take because we had recorded with some people who are singer songwriters and they'll do 30 takes they think you're, that makes you better and it doesn't it, you know, mm -hmm. the energy just flies out the window and it's infuriating. So when we did our wig billy, okay, the reason we kicked the wig billies is we kicked the guitar player out of the band <laughs> and the drummer moved away. And so we uh, started playing kind of Americana stuff like the knitters. Hmm. And so I play my dulcimer a lot and my acoustic Martin, Paul's playing his guitar. And we thought, well, we sound like hillbillies. And then we go, oh, the wig billies. So that's why we <laughs> changed that. So the second CD we made of the Wig Billies, we only were in the studio 11 hours. We were so well rehearsed and we do, and Paul and I were both on the same page about this one or two takes and that is it. You can't do one or two takes, next song. Mm -hmm. is, Simple that play, is that playing completely, completely live or is that overdubs too? I mean, I mean it, well, when, you, first, when you say one take, is it completely live or do you? Yes. So that's one take for like the backing and then one take for this or you know, I don't know what you're you know. We preferred to do it all like we were on stage somewhere. Okay. And then the harmonies, of course, would be an overdub. But um mm -hmm. the I'm not a real good singer. I'm kind of like um uh, God uh, uh 
Godfrey, I, I not a real singer, but I can sing really good harmony. And that's why I got always got into bands and stuff. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I find when I'm playing and I sing, I'm much more of a ham and mm -hmm. not so self-conscious. Because when you're standing in front of, you know, the mic and that round thing in front of you and you're trying to sing, it's really intimidating. It's, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not fun. So yeah, one takes were the order of the day. And uh, 11 hours, I mean, I was pretty proud of that. <laughs> we shoved it up everyone's asses too that we did it like you we were re anal retainer so when we did the wig titans cd that was we did analog we we did the tape the old-fashioned tape and of course it broke and we almost yeah. lost the whole session oh, then we did digital for the second um there is a difference in the sound but uh for efficiency sake digi is pretty good mm -hmm. You know, it depends on what you're doing too. We're doing, you know, acoustic instruments. Um, they, they come across pretty well in a digital format, I think. So anyway, what are we doing now? Uh, not much. Uh, this <laughs> Sunday, our old drummer is coming back to visit. So we'll have a little jam session. But in the last two years, I've decided to learn drums. So oh, wow. I took a drumming. Well, I've been listening to rock and roll for 60 years and I've been playing bass for 40. So I, I, I mean, I know I, would, I, I can anticipate riffs like crazy. So yeah, I just uh, got on YouTube and, and typed in beginning drum lessons. And some woman named Lisa did the so kind of play by beat, play by writing it down or play by ear. And I went, bingo. Yep. And so I just started playing every day and I love it. Oh my God, all your troubles go out the door when you're playing drums. It's, it's yeah. so therapeutic. It's just, it's... <laughs> Like the caveman hitting the rock with the stick, right? It <laughs> appeals to me. My wife just picked up uh, a Fender electric guitar for like hundred dollars, which is an incredible yeah. deal. And uh, so she went over to Guitar Center and showed it to them and everything, and they sold her an amp. So because there was no amp, so and now she loves it. She's learning to play, and she's doing exactly what you're doing, going on YouTube and saying, "Oh, okay." And I even said that. I said. I don't play guitar. I used to play piano, but I said I know like things like Louie Louie and Wild Thing are very easy to play. It's just like three chords. So I mean, if you learn that, you can start playing other things. But you know, start off with the basics that at least sound like something you're playing. So and she's doing it. So you know. yeah, that's a mistake a lot of teachers make. They they um, don't recognize that there's different ways of learning, and you'll often get a guy that. Um, like I, I took a bass lesson once and the guy said, oh, don't use a pick. You have to use your finger and it has to be this way and you have to dampen the string. So we spent a half an hour going thump, thump, thump. And I'm going, screw this. Yeah. Like if I taught guitar, I teach a kid a, a really cool lick like the beginning of like a Van Halen song. So they can yeah. go home and they play that thing over and over and over and over. And every time they play it, they like it. And that gives you reinforcement. Yeah. And the other rule is, is if you practice every day, you're going to learn it. it. Might take you five years, it might take you ten. Right. But if you don't practice, you'll get nowhere. Right. And it's that, but it's that easy. But it's like hard to for people to make the time or make the motivation. I think and the same thing with cartooning. You got to have that motivation. You got to be kind of confident. Mm -hmm. Yeah, puppy. Uh, yeah, I have dogs. <laughs> um. <laughs> Anyway, well, ask? good luck. We, we, well, tell her just you know, just do a little every day. It's just fifteen minutes yep. and chromatics. Everybody always thinks you have to play scales like da 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 da. No, no. do no. chromatics on the first riff. Go this way, then go backwards. Go up to the second riff, yeah. and it'll build up your your muscles in your fingers, yeah. and, it, and it trains your ear to hear uh, half tones too. Yeah. You know, half notes, things like I, that. I was basically saying it's kind of like the blind leading the blind, but I just said. <laughs> uh, from what I've heard on learning a guitar, you know, learn like chords first, you know, it's like, I don't know if there's a right or wrong about that, but you know, you could tell me if you, you know, so, and, and learn where the fingering is so you, you can just do it automatically without, you know, looking down at what yeah. you're doing and things like that, you know, and practice that, you know, but yeah, I wouldn't do the scales. Uh, scales are good for when I used to do piano, you know, because it kind of limbers the fingers. And you just, right, right. Blah, blah, blah. But I can understand the guitar, you know, it wouldn't make sense because it's not the same type of instrument at all. So it's like, you know. <laughs> no flats, no sharps. Right. 
Yeah. That's what's great about sevens. <laughs> yeah. <Ugh. Good. laughs> Yeah, that's why I never liked ukulele. I, I was painting ukuleles for a guy named Rick Turner up at Renaissance Guitars in Santa Cruz. And he was sending me these big tenor. I mean, they're bigger than the normal ukuleles. Yeah. So I was painting them with acrylic paints and, and then putting naked ladies on there. And they <laughs> came into my mind. And they were selling it for like 800 bucks at the NAM convention up in um, Anaheim. And um, I got a free one. And the chords, the, the the position of the chords were just so difficult. It it just and the necks are so small. I mean, I'm used to this big long neck on my Rickenbacker, you know, and and I just couldn't get behind the plink 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 plink. plink. I want something that goes bang, you know, sustain. So I ended up giving it to Wayno, you know, the mm -hmm. cartoonist. Yep. And um, yeah. now you yeah. mentioned uh, other instruments you play. So could you just you it, so could you just say what you know how to play at least reasonably well <laughs> well i have a rickenbacker bass uh a blonde one just like paul mccartney's with the checkerboard inlay on the on the on the perimeter and i have a martin acoustic bass i have a dulcimer that somebody lent me that i never gave back so i just uh you know she was a coke dealer and so she probably i don't know she's probably dead by now anyway so i started <laughs> i always liked open tuning and there's only really two notes on a dulcimer there's a and d hmm. And you can play uh, in the pretty much key of A, P, key of D. You don't actually play chords, you play intervals, like maybe just two strings and just hit those. Like when you're playing an F chord, you don't hit the big fat E string because it'll make it sound funky. Hmm. And I, I really got into that. Of course, listening to Blue by Joni Mitchell got everybody turned on to dulcimer because prior to that, it was Jeannie Ritchie and you had to play it with a feather. Right. And play it on your lap. Well, along comes Richard Farina, who's playing it like a guitar. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the guy wrote um, uh, Birmingham Sunday and the Falcon, and he was married to uh, Mimi Farina, which was little Joe Baez's sister. And, and then he died young in a you know, motorcycle accident, famous kind of folk rock guy. Mm -hmm. And so I played that, and I do a little keyboard, not much. We have a little um, Casio thing where I know the basic, you know, I could play the octave bass and maybe a triad and that's about it. But I like the, the sound, I like the sound effects on some of these things. Right. And I play a little, little guitar. I write songs on guitar. Hmm. So, but I'm not, I'm a, I'm bare. I know a few chords. I know, you know, I'm, yeah, I know a few chords. That's about it. Oh, now drums. So, and are so you so, like, you're self taught on everything basically? Oh right? yeah. Except for the one bass lesson with them. <laughs> the one bass lesson. No, I I I'm a, I, uh, I I don't like lessons. Yeah. I don't like um, be classrooms. Yeah. Uh, things go too slow for me. Uh, I'm better off on my own. I don't like assignments. I don't right. like homework. Um, no, I am. I I had to learn that uh, after I rejected art and got into music, and I realized how my brain worked. Right. And it's so you're self-taught on art as well. You don't. You never really took classes either, correct? No, I didn't. And yeah. that was what what was infuriating about being an art major is every teacher thinks you're only taking their class. Right. <laughs> they don't understand when you're in college, you've got, you know, 12 units, maybe uh, 15 if you're crazy. And uh, being an art major is really expensive. I mean, they give you a list of all this crap you got to buy. Mm -hmm. I think the only people in college that get off pretty good are the dancers. All you need is a pair of leotards and you move around. But uh, music and, you know, you know art, you got to be rich. Yeah. And that's my problem with me is I couldn't afford all the art supplies and I uh, wanted, I couldn't get a job on the campus either. It was really hard back then. Hmm. So, so yeah, self-taught. Yeah. For me, just to tell you where I'm at, you know, I got a degree in broadcasting, but then I always in the back of my mind wanted to do art. Um, and then I ended up doing the cartoon art, the cartoon art, uh, art instruction school, you know, the one oh. that, uh, has draw tip draw tippy you know and you send everything to the oh, yeah. mails and everything and it took me four years to do it but i did uh, complete it you're supposed to do it in two years but i said you know i'm an adult and i'm working i got i don't have time to draw all day but 
the fortunate thing about doing it that way, since you talked about art supplies, it's a big flat fee, although it's probably exorbitant now because I did it 30 years ago. <laughs> um, but they give you everything, all the supplies. You just get these packages shipped to you and then your next lesson and stuff like that. It's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You went to the Tippy School of Art? You actually yeah. signed up for that thing and, yeah. and they were legit? They're legit. Charles Schultz worked there and, uh, you know, <laughs> Oh, you know, not, at, not at the time I did it, but, you know, he worked there before Peanuts and uh, then he uh, sold the strip. And so then that was the end of that. And he left uh, art, art, the art instruction school. But yeah, it's the one they used to say, draw the pirate, draw me, yes. draw Tippy, you know, all that stuff. Oh and, my God. Yeah, so I went for it. <laughs> yeah. so I'm a living survivor that I actually went through. But it did teach me some things that I didn't know because uh prior to that yeah it's like you have you're kind of at the whim of what an art teacher wants you to know um it, it, it's a pretty wide ranging coverage and so i did learn things about shading that i never knew before i learned things about perspective that i didn't know before yeah. also i learned that i'm not very good at either of those things you know and i, <laughs> and I draw very cartoony i'm very uh somebody said once uh, on a good day, I'm kind of like Russell Myers of Broomhilda or something like that, you know, that type of cartoon. But, mm -hmm. you, know, I go, okay. you know, but I never pursued it too strongly like yourself, you know, where, you know, and I've had a couple things published here and there, but nothing of any great notoriety or, or plain really. Anyways. <laughs> so, um, well, perspective is a pain in the ass and I just ignore it. In fact, I have the distinction of being in Jessica Abel's book um, on perspective, 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 and I don't know what the number of the pages, but I am a prime example of somebody who did a page that knows nothing about perspective mm. and, um, and ignores <laughs> all the rules. So she asked me, can I put this in here? Because this one scene you have in Life of the Party is just, you didn't pay attention to anything. And I go, sure, write it, go ahead. It's I mean, tough, the perspective who is cares? tough. It's a comic book. Yeah. <laughs> it it's, just, it's funny, on Facebook recently, somebody was asking that, uh, what is the most difficult thing to draw? And most people were drawing hands, saying hands and feet. It's like, that stuff's easy. It, it's perspective to me, you know, it's just getting everything placed correctly. You know, it takes a lot of effort to do it well, you know, I think. Now, maybe there's, Draftsman, you mentioned Jack Kirby, you know, earlier or something like that, that could do it like this. But, you know, I don't yeah. know. I, it was like, he, they probably had tons of practice, but it could be a natural talent. I don't know, you know, so. Um, you are in a different book. I did read a, uh, read a little book behind you is uh, uh, Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics. You're in there as an uh, art example too. I don't know if you knew that. Yes, I did. <laughs> and it caused me a lot of grief because uh. a lot well, thought that pyramid meant you know that you're the best and they go yeah mary's at the top of the pyramid how'd you get up there well if they had read it the whole idea of the pyramid was realism to abstract from realism it, it's like from one extreme this this and this and then this and this and so i, well, I was, do yeah i know people complained people, about that wow huh? people complained about that Oh, there's some, you can see it in people's eyes, you know, the, the, the <laughs> envy, which is so stupid. But when uh, Scott was putting that book together, it was, um, I, I went to Comic-Con and he goes, I got something to show you. And I'm looking at these pages going, oh, will you marry me? <laughs> wow, I didn't know. But when the first zine my friends and I did was called Demo. And they worked at a print shop, so they got everything. They stole everything, basically. And um, that was my first zine. And I sent it to Scott, and he wrote me back right away. And he was going, oh, this black and white you're doing, this is great. And he was really incredibly supportive. And um, so I was just thrilled and honored mm -hmm. to be in that book. And, and, I mean, and he, when he has that big globe of all the comic styles, I mean, he covers everybody in there. There's Christine Critter, Julie um the Hernandez brothers I mean he really he he was a visionary where he could see where comics were going and he also predicted more women being into comics and that's certainly the it's it's I, I've seen it with my own eyes I've been going to comic con since 1986 mm -hmm. and um the first year I went some guy asked me he said are you looking for your kids 
<laughs> I, I was looking at the same movie. If you look for your, I go, I, sir, I'm a cartoonist. How dare you? Ah. Had, they published yet, but I, yeah. I knew where I was going. And now it's it's incredible. The young adult market, uh, thanks to uh, Raina and a lot of people, it's just, it, it's, we're in the bookstores, like Scott predicted we would be. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I of noticed course, the change oh, too. I used to go to San Diego as early as 91. That was the year. Uh -huh. Last year I went was 2013. But, you know, it's like during that change, not only did it get hideously crowded, but yeah. <laughs> it was a major paradigm shift as far as, you know, little floppy pamphlet superhero comics to more, you know, graphic novel books and paperbacks and things like that. So definitely. Yep. Well, you know, in the old days, there were there were a lot more freaks and the costumes were wilder. It, did you, uh, there was the Comic Con, it used to be on 2nd and B Street before they moved to the big place. Never went to those. Yeah, the, the year I first went was the first year at the convention center, so. 91, there, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a real, that was like, wow. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and the, yeah, there was, Back in the old days, there were a lot more drag queens and, and just, just odd, you know, strange that came off the street. And then it sort of became, I, I couldn't believe it. Two years ago, we were waiting to get in. They, they weren't opening the doors right away and it was hot. And there were two people next to me dressed up as superheroes, but they had the fake six packs and the fake muscles. Mm -hmm. And they told me they actually have um, rubber hosing that goes all inside of the costume with ice water. Oh, wow. To keep them cool because of all this foam and this padding. And I'm just like, God, just like Dune. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And they were telling me the thousands of dollars that they spent on these costumes. It was like, wow. And it was this husband and wife, and that was their thing. Yeah. That they, they like to, you know, do it yeah, for four days. Yeah. I mean, I admire costuming. I've never gotten into it, the cosplaying and all that stuff. It's like, to me, it's like, you know, I don't even like dry, dressing up for Halloween. So, <laughs> but I always admire people who put a lot of effort and energy into it, and their costume looks perfect. You know, and I'm like, wow. Yeah. You know. <laughs> well, if you go to my, I have a, a a thing where I posted all the pictures I've taken of Comic Con from 1987 to about 2003. Hundreds of pictures. It's called Mary in Comic Con Land. Dot mm -hmm. spot dot com mm -hmm. so you can see it's like 700 photos oh. <laughs> and so a lot of pictures i took of people you I mean you just go can I take your picture and they just go yeah of course <laughs> they, they live for that so right, I, you right. know, i'm not shy so I, I i like to do that every year um uh i think the guys costumes are even now even more flamboyant than the women mm -hmm. so um but you can see what the Comic Con was like back in the day if you check out my little thing. The reason I did that was in 2008, we had these horrible fires here and the mm. smoke was so bad you couldn't go outside for four days. So I looked mm. at my closet and there was thousands of photos in a big pile mm. that I had, you know, I just forgot about. So it took me three months to separate them all, categorize them try to find out what date you know the date and, and and match it up and call up people and i did it but uh i had to I had to tap into my ocd pretty good to do that it was uh, you know the scanning and everything i don't even know how i did it and i just stopped at 2003 because i got tired <laughs> well after 700 photos god wow <laughs> So yeah, I know. And then and just my luck, uh, in 2019, I was invited as a special guest. And it's really nice when they do that. They put you up at the Marriott and you get money for food every day. And of course, you have to be in like 20 panels right. and you got to earn your keep. And they offered me that this year for this Comic Con special edition that was on Thanksgiving weekend. And I turned them down. I um, it's, it's too soon. I yeah. I, I want to live long enough to finish my book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to get sick. Right. And I've had my shots and the booster and all that kind of stuff, but still, yeah. I'm the, the Comic Con will be there again. Yeah. yeah and I would not, and I would prefer to go when I go next time. I want to have my book at least halfway done or almost done. And because every, you know, why talk about something you're working on? I mean, right. beyond. <laughs> 
I yeah. know it's it's always the case, you know, if you if you're, you have a bunch of books here and they'll say, "What are you working on?" Oh, I'm working on a book about such and such. Ooh, I'm interested in that, and it's like I don't have anything to show you, you know. It's like <laughs> so, I get it totally. Um, yeah, and I haven't done any shows uh, for two years either, you know. It's like, and then when I came down for the first time to California in October, there just happened to be a smallish comic book show in Pleasant Hill. Northern California, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, I said I could go to that. San Diego is a bit much. I agree with you right now. You know, it's like because I don't know who who's going around, and it seems it always seems like wall to wall people, even at the best of times. So you know, it's like I don't want to be in there with everybody and who might be unvaccinated, or you know, who knows? You know, <laughs> oh, those you could forge one of those cards. Yeah, exactly. Like, so yeah, I'm with I'm with you. At least another year for a show like that yes definitely you know but a smallest show yeah i can do a small show <laughs> what do you do for shows what, what do you are you well on that one i just showed oh. up just as a fan you know because i hadn't okay. done anything in so long i wasn't going to sit there and display because i you know i just it was like a last minute decision to even go to it but i said uh -huh. i'd like to go because you know if you like i still buy old comics but buying them off of ebay is hideous right now so you know oh, everything's God. like 500 dollars for the stupidest <laughs> book so but you can still find deals at a comic show because people bring in this stuff they don't want to bring it back home they're not going to charge 500 dollars if they could sell for a couple hundred or less you know and i'm cheapskate i like something for a dollar you know it's like and i found really weird things like some big boy comics from the old restaurant and stuff like that you know <laughs> I remember those, so, yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, found some Harveys. I have pretty much every Harvey ever published, but I found a few that I didn't have, and so, <laughs> so that's what I would do. Uh, if I did set up, yeah, I, I do have a table usually with my books and things like that. Um, a lot of times I do shows with Lee, so you know he has the normal Lee's comic sure. display, and then he gives me, you know, and Arnold, you can get this little tiny corner here for one book, you know. <laughs> He's not that bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but, uh, you know. Uh, well, it's amazing what's out there. I was down in Lucadia. My friend has an antique store. Um, it's, it's Everything's got a chip or, you know, something wrong with it. But, it, you know, he still has interesting stuff. And I see this comic called Little Aspirin. Yeah. I'm going, Little Aspirin? What the hell is this? He goes, oh, take it. And of course it's in it's not it's in fair condition you know i know the i know the scale but it's probably take off a little iodine the jimmy yeah, Helto iodine I would, too, I was oh, yeah, say, yeah 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 <laughs> and it yeah. was just and uh, so i put it up on facebook and you wouldn't believe it the people were like i've never seen this oh my god what a find yeah, yeah. And, uh, and well i mean it's like there's all these like knockoffs of harvey or knockoffs yeah. on dennis the menace you know and you, you yeah. see both you know it's like they'll be just like little cutesy poo girls or boys or whatever, or they'll be mischief, mischievous boys or girls sometimes, you know, and, and things like that. It's kind of weird that, that, and it's an entire genre that they don't bother to make any comics of anymore, which is really interesting. So, you know, and that's the type of stuff I buy and still buy, you know, you know, I, I, I'll buy occasional superhero stuff, but you know, yeah, I like, I like my Archies, I like my Harveys. <laughs> I like anything humor i have all the mads and cracks and crazies and oh yeah things. so you know so that's how i knew you from weirdo because it's like you know i was already a crumb fan and it's like okay you know here we go so it was only a natural on that um i have a bunch of different questions so i'll just kind of jump around but you know um one thing you mentioned you mentioned your mother but you didn't say into detail and so i wanted to ask about that so uh she worked for disney in the early 40s uh yeah were you aware of did you know that at the time or were, were, did you come along later um uh, I mean, <laughs> much later okay so so but i mean okay so let's rephrase that so that's what i had to ask being try, trying to be discreet i should have find out uh let's see is did you what happened when you discovered what your mom had done that you, she had worked for disney was that interesting to you or did it annoy you if it was too commercial or what okay well what the story was she got married at 19 mm -hmm. and a year later my dad got called over to north africa to fight in the war mm -hmm. 
and she had to move in with her parents that lived on uh, 42nd and Danker in LA. And my dad was on a train and he started talking to people, you know, because everybody met people on trains back then because that's what people did. And these guys, he said, well, my wife needs a job. She's bored. He goes, well, what does she do? Well, she's an artist. She designed, uh, graduated from um, college as a fashion design major. And they said, well, tell her to come down to the studio. It's uh, Walt Disney Studios. Tell her to bring a portfolio, samples of her ink work, what she can do. And she got the job. Mm -hmm. And... um, month and a half later, she got promoted to the animation department and worked with a guy named Johnny Bond. And she was only there a year and a half because my dad uh, came home. He pulled up to the studio. I mean, she celebrated her 21st birthday there alone and she didn't see him for two and a half years thinking he'd be, you know, dead, you know, killed in the war every day. So she started giving, you know, going to church and all that. And so the day he showed up in a taxi with his uniform on, she introduced him to everybody and off they went to uh, Fort Lauderdale Hmm. where he was stationed. And that's where my brother was born. So she worked there from 41 to 43 and she wanted to be a housewife and have kids. Hmm. And so she gave up a, a potentially good career. And she, I think at that time, I forget her last name. Her name was Ruth somebody. We met her, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll, okay. Uh, she uh, collected art that she found in the trash hmm. and she thought it was cute. They were like drawings of Mickey Mouse and, and Goofy and little thumbnails that the, the uh, animators would just like be monkeying around just to get inspired and then they throw them away. Now they take all these drawings and they put them through a slot in a locked room and nobody can get in there, but she, um, just took these things home and I asked her why she goes well I thought they were cute so when I was about nine or ten I was going through some boxes in the basement looking for sheet music or something to draw on I yeah. think maybe and I found a stack of all this Disney art and I'm like what in the hell is this and I'm looking at it, I knew it was animation art because it was on an animation paper and some of the drawings are on acetate hmm. and um and I asked her, where did you buy these? She goes, oh, I worked there for a while. <laughs> and she still has that attitude because to her at that time, she was away from her husband. She was lonely. Yeah. I mean, she had a job and everything, but she, uh, it was a, a, a dark time. Yeah. And she doesn't think it's a big deal. Yeah. So um, about 10 years ago, she, or I think it was a, before that, she, I said, where's all that art you had? Oh, I can't find it. I think someone stole it. I, I, I can't find it in the house. And I'm like, oh God, here's my, my inheritance. Yeah. And so then she calls me up one day. She goes, oh, I found it. It was under a ribbon box. Yeah. I go, I'll be right there. So I drove up an hour and a half because I'm down in San Diego. She's up in Palos Verdes. Oh, I, I used to live there. So I go, give me that. Give me that. <laughs> I go, You're not losing this again. <laughs> goes, well, that's still mine. I go, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so you have it? I have it. Oh. And I have it in my kiln, my ceramic kiln. And I have everything in plastic bags. But a lot of the acetates are, are rippling. You can smell the acidic acid. It's gassing out. Mm. I'm not going to buy that those thick plastic nuclear things that you put. If the acetate ripples, it ripples. Yeah. It was wartime paint. So she had a stack of a lot of animation cells that all melted together. Mm. She had to throw them away. So I am um, talked to a few of my friends and they go, well, do you have any proof that she worked there? And I go, well, you know, that's probably a good idea to find out, right. you know, to get the word Providence, you know? So I took a deep breath. I called up the studios. I got a hold of archives. I explained my story. And the woman goes, oh, hold on, man. I'll look in the car. And she goes, hey, here, here. We got her employee card right here. Oh. I go from 41. Uh. Would you like me to email it to you? And I go, would I? Uh. Wow. So right at that very moment, a woman named Mindy <laughs> Johnson was sitting, was in the office and she was working on a book called Ink and Paint about the women that worked for Disney. And there was always this common misconception that no women work there. Well, that's not true. No, that's not true. <laughs> the book's like this thick and there's like hundreds. I think of I have a book about it in the stack that's against the wall up uh-huh. there. 
haven't read it yet, but it is about women artists in animation. And yeah. Angel Kate. Yeah. So and there's a picture of her in there and she's mentioned a few times. And so, you know, Mindy's this go-getter and she had a, a you know, a, a talk at the D23 Disney convention in Anaheim. And then they had a special thing at the um, theater where they give out the Oscars, where she gave a talk and the, all the ladies were on stage. Mm -hmm. And it was like this, you know, two hour thing, but it was quite grand. They put us up in a hotel and paid for everything. It was a $600 suite for my mom and I. And we had our names on the chairs, just like the Oscars. I mean, it was all very fancy. And, and, and the oldest lady there, this is that Ruth gal again, she worked at the original Hyperion Studios. And at that time, she was 106. She just recently passed, I think a month ago, at 111. Yeah, I've heard about her. Yeah. And she wheeled up to my mom and she goes, I know you. And my mom goes, Here's, Here's now you work for Johnny Bond. And my mom's like, Oh my God, because she was hoping she'd meet some of her old friends, but a lot of them have passed. She's 99 now, my mom. Mm. So she was like 95, 96 when we had this, you know, thing. Yeah. So um, uh, after that event, my mom goes, I don't want to do any more of these things. I feel like a fraud. I was only there for a year and a half. I didn't invent anything. I didn't do any. <laughs> she worked on three films for the army and the three caballeros. And she did... Uh, a lot of tracing for that. So is she that really what worked... the cells are that you have? What's in that stack? Then? Is, oh, is it... a lot of it's stuff she like nothing that none of her none of her artwork. Oh, I thought it was uh, her artwork. Okay. It's no, just stuff she, she collected. Okay. Stuff she collected. She did one drawing of a guy that like a like a, 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 a leader of a band in a mariachi band, but she was not an animator. She was doing um, um, in between drawing, I think, mm -hmm. but no coloring or anything. Right. And um, the drawings are, they're all over. There's one sequence of 23 drawings of Donald Duck rendered in colored pencils where he's running down the hill and the, the, with the lines behind him, the show motion. And it starts off with this little tiny drawing of Donald and they, each page it goes, he's going faster and faster and faster. And it's this pile, it's numbered one, three, five, seven, I don't know why they do that in animation, but it's, it's an amazing sequence of some guy, you can just see some guy at his desk mm -hmm. trying to work out what Donald's gonna look like when he's running really fast in color mm -hmm. and having the color bleed behind him mm -hmm. to show you know, motion. So stuff like that, the, the little, um, there's a, it was a, they get a series of Pluto shorts and there's one called Springtime or something and Pluto sees a little moth on a plant, and it's a it's a a, um, a little male, I think a a beetle, and he's going dun, 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 and then he forms a cocoon, and then he comes out of it as a female, <laughs> like he's the first transgendered character, right? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a sexy blonde with the wings, and she's got the long blonde hair. So there's a bunch of those drawings. Huh. And then uh, 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 one of them uh, is pretty valuable, I think. It's Donald Duck, and it's from from Der Fuhrer's face. Mm -hmm. And he's doing the Nazi salute. And there's a bear, a, a bayonet sticking him in the butt. Yeah. <laughs> and he's got the armband on and everything. And so that's pretty interesting. I don't know how she got a hold of that. But they're mostly the animation paper with the pencil drawings on them. Huh. And then notations from the somebody in the that I don't know what it means but it's obviously obviously in in office notations and things like that a Disney historian would certainly know what all this is I don't right now hmm. so um, I'm just hanging on to this stuff and um, it deserves to be donated yeah as a collection right <laughs> I'm not I will not sell off this stuff because I've met people who are collectors and they're the biggest jerks. They say, oh, well, the market's soft right now. Nobody's buying this stuff. Yeah. Bullshit. <laughs> and so I'm, you know, I, I, I've decided in my living trust that all my comic art, and I have a quite extensive, extensive collection of comic art, and my stuff's going to go to the Billy Ireland um, Art Museum mm -hmm. in Columbus. Yeah, I've heard about yeah. that uh, recently. Um, I was in discussions, it fell through, but I was in discussions to sell my Harvey Comics collection. And I wasn't mm -hmm. really crazy about doing it, but I would have done it for the right 
price, but you know, it fell through. So there's no need to discuss how much it was or anything other than uh, somebody said, don't sell it, hold on to it, don't sell it and give it to the Billy Ireland thing when you pass away. And that's, you know, I go, that's not a bad idea. I mean, it is a complete collection. I don't know, you know, what they can do with it, but you know, it's like, I won't be here, so I won't go. So. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's the thing. Well, I, I went there in 2019. I was invited to go to the CXC uh, event, and mm -hmm. I took a tour inside there, and mm -hmm. it's really something. I mean, they have the you go to these special rooms, and they, they're cold, and everybody's wearing gloves, and they asked us what we wanted to see, so I wanted to see some Chester Gould stuff, and mm -hmm. um, Hank Ketchum, you know, the, old, you know, the masters, and the guy did the Little King, and yeah. so I you know, get to see that stuff right there. It, it's amazing. But what's was kind of horrifying is now I'm not sure it's a yellow kid or Windsor McKay. Oh God, I, I shouldn't even tell the story, but one of these famous guys, a son got the artwork and he started cutting it up to sell it in little sections. Yeah. I think it might be Windsor McKay. I'm not yeah. sure, but it just, if you don't, have plans for your stuff when you're gone anything can happen right and, right. and these 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 snakes that sell buy and sell they're horse traders they, and they prey on people in their time of grief and and sadness and they just you know, offers pennies on the dollar and then some collector buys it and it's gonna, i mean i have a page from the um the rawhide kid and i think jack kirby inked it uh mm -hmm. Paul Levitz was over here with Karen Green, and I asked him, who, did Kirby ink this? He goes, ah, it's probably him and David, Dave Ayers, hmm. Ayers. He said they used to trade pa pages back and forth, and some guy wanted a cigarette, Dick, the other Dick guy. Ayers? Just, did Dick? Dick, yeah, okay. Dick, Dick. I, I'm not very knowledgeable about the That's gold. okay. <laughs> but my friend uh, who passed, he, in his will, said I could take one page out of his collection, hmm. and he said he had a Kirby. I spent four hours looking through all these portfolios. It's sick to my stomach. They're just in portfolios. Yeah. So after that experience, I took all my art and took a couple of months and framed. I used to be a custom picture framer. So oh, I got out the rag board and the UV glass and the frames and I, everything's on my wall now. So I can enjoy it. Yeah. And it's protected because we have silverfish here in Sanitas. We, boy, do we have silverfish. <laughs> and every one of my nice art books has a little nibble. Mm. Yeah, well you know what i don't really care books books schmucks you know i mean i have the only valuable book i have is the grateful dead hardback that jerry garcia has a tip in uh, oh. autograph yeah. that one's in plastic that's in a bag um I'm, I'm thinking about selling that here pretty soon because grateful dead is just there's no end to that right right <laughs> it's like the like, like the tiki oasis people god everything tiki tiki Right. And I grew up with tiki's, you know. <laughs> so you mentioned a couple of your influences. Do you have originals of Chester Gould or uh, Oslogo? Oslogo, how you pronounce his name? Uh, no, I the, the old. I think probably I have a Ramona Fraden page. That somebody gave me. Marie Severin gave me uh, the Big Book of Bad, the Practice, Practice, Practice two pages she did about the uh, Florence Foster Jenkins who couldn't sing. Remember the Meryl Street made that movie about her. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, Marie used a variety of materials and some of the marking pen that she used, it's turned yellow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, she and I became friends because I interviewed her for a comic book artist mm -hmm. and we just hit it off. So we traded art and I have a really neat sketch of her that she did of me as on the beach drawing and then the hulks behind me going Rah! it says watch out for those beach boys mary and <laughs> so um that, that's about she's as close to the golden age as i have of, of stuff and you know drawing she, i think she did for craft the some guy reading a comic and he gets hit by a car and, and she gave it to me for my birthday i i this is marie severin mm -hmm. yeah she did a couple things for crack but the, the main place she did art was uh, crazy for Marvel and yeah. uh, not Brand X. She did a lot of stuff. You know? This might have been from crazy. Yeah. I've never seen an issue of crazy, so I don't know. <laughs> what What's going to on, do? dogs? I'm doing a podcast. Anyway. <laughs> dog. How dare dog. they bark? <laughs> Good boy. Yeah. 
two girl dogs. So I got uh, Mia and uh, Lulu. So. <laughs> what kind of dogs? Uh, one, well, they're not in here. Um, Lulu is a larger dog, half, uh, um, what's it called? Uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, it's a ger German one with a long mustache. Uh, maybe it's that. And half Chihuahua, which is an odd. Irish one. Wolfhound? Um, it's a kind of a theory. Come here. Come here. Lulu, come here. Okay. <laughs> gonna... Let's play Guess the okay. Breed. Come on. I just love dogs. I have two cats and a dog. All my animals have been rescued too. <laughs> All right. What? I know if you to do though. something, they don't do it. All right, come on. Come on. Here, let's try this again. Come here. <laughs> this is exciting riveting television, but I'm actually going to play. Come on, Lulu. Come on. Come on, Lulu. Come on, Lulu. You need a little treat. Uh, yeah, she doesn't want to do it. She's an older dog. Um, but anyway, the other one is half um, uh, half a Westie and half, uh, what's it called? Havanese. So, That's a pistol. Yep. Uh, but she looks like Toto in The Wizard of Oz. So, oh, like, God. Yeah. But Toto was a different terrier breed, but they're both terriers, both dogs. Anyway, mm -hmm. so... <laughs> Anyway, enough of the, the do you have dogs then? I mean, yeah, we animals? have two cats and we have a, our dog is a uh, Shiba Inu Corgi blend. Mm -hmm. So she's long and white with liver spots, but she's got longer legs. She's not, doesn't have the short legs like a Corgi. And she's, uh, but she's got that Corgi temperament. She doesn't like other dogs. She was rescued from a hoarder mm. uh, north of Los Angeles. He had a five acre ranch with 50 dogs. And she was, she'd already had puppies when we got her, never socialized, never walked on a leash. Hmm. So it, it, it took some doing, but she's a real smart dog. Best dog I've ever had. Her name is Buddy. No. <laughs> oh, Lulu's half schnauzer, half. Oh, Lulu. schnauzer. There, oh, that's the one with the mustache yes. that goes down like this. Anyway, yes, yes. she looks kind of like a goat. <laughs> but yeah, well, anyway. schnauzers, they have their own way of doing things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean. It, 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 she, I, I'm basically going to call her bipolar because she wants to be petted all the time. But if I pet her in the wrong way, she starts growling and biting it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I have to do it yeah. just gently on the head, but I can't go near her butt because it's just, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. don't touch the ears. Because, <laughs> <you know. laughs> oh. Well, Buddy was really useful for me as a model when I was doing Billy the Bee because, of course, she's kind of coyote ish looking. She's got the coyote ears and Mm -hmm. And and I in the muzzle, I could you know look at her, and it, that was very useful because she's very you know uh, wolfy looking. Mm -hmm. So tell me about some of those. You sent me some of those pictures. So Billy the Bee, I've not seen other than your cover. So what is that one about? Well, uh, one day I went through kind of a slump uh, <laughs> in the comic business for about eight years. Um. I, 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 a, bunch of, a couple things happened. Um, I, I did the three comics with Zongo Comics and it wasn't me. And so I stopped at the third issue because I thought I had a, a terribly original plot line and it was just like something Jeff Smith would have done in Bone after I read Bone. And I was like, oh God, are we gonna think I'm copying this guy? Eh. So I said, screw this. And I really didn't like the people that worked for Bongo and Zongo. I like Matt. Yeah. But the people they had at the time, uh, the one guy that was my uh, sort of call editor, who will be remain nameless, mm -hmm. was an idiot. Mm -hmm. And then I did a deal with Nickelodeon to take one of the the, the, Kukum, the Tiki guys from the first issue. They wanted to do a development deal and make it into a show. And two weeks into that, I realized this was not my scene. I hated it. <laughs> I wrote it out for a year and a half, made a little, got a little money in my pocket, not a lot. And when they passed on the idea, I got my rights back. So that was a major thing for me. And then what else happened? Um, oh, I wanted to do a collection of all my stuff and four publishers told me to take a walk. <laughs> so I'm just going, kind of, okay, fuck the comic world. <laughs> so um, I always went back to my, my happy place, which was music. Uh -huh. so, after, so after about eight years, I thought, I'm gonna do one of these graphic novels. So I started thinking about, oh, what 
brought it on. I was thinking about where, where does honey come from? And mm -hmm. you always read it's bee vomit, it's bee poop, it's bee, it's this, this. <laughs> so I started researching it and I just went, oh my God, here it is. It handed right to me. I mean, when I learned all the worker bees were all female, I just went, huh? <laughs> and and I, when I learned how honey was made, it appealed to my, you know, I'm really interested in science. Mm. I was almost a microbiology major in college, but I can't mm. do that now. And uh, I just started reading more and more. And I just went, my God, this is, this is, this is golden. So that's what got me going. And then I started thinking about, well, there's mutants in the superhero world. Why not make a mutant animal? <laughs> you know, it's the size of a hummingbird. Why not? It's a comic. Mm -hmm. And, you know. And I thought, well, the, and then the bee will be not the the uh, scout, but he'll be something else. And so I just kind of went from that, went from there. And I decided to be silly and have the bee sing and mm -hmm. illustrate lyrics and just do what I wanted. Because cool. why the hell not? <laughs> and of course, when I got the book done, a lot of people thought it was autobiographical. Really? Auto, it's called Billy <laughs> the Bee. It's autobiographical. Come on, hello. <laughs> and... Um, uh, it was, I, I enjoyed it very much. I'd never done cross hatching before and I really got into it because Mine Shaft Magazine, which is that little zine from North Carolina, I got really influenced by this guy named Christoph Mueller from Germany. And then yeah. another guy named Bill Crook that likes to do uh, these really cross hatch uh, reviews of old towns and things that are published in there. And I thought, and Crumb, of course, and I thought, you know what? I can do cross hatching and I can do it better. Yeah. Yeah, let's see if I can do that. <laughs> so that was kind of, and I really enjoyed it. And I learned that it really adds a, a third color because you have black and you have white, and then you have gray. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I learned it a lot. So I wanted to do after, because the main characters are the bee and a rattlesnake and a coyote. And I wanted to do the next book either about the coyote or the snake. And Gary Groth at the Comic Con goes, Would you please do an autobiographical book? Yeah. I, why? Because everything right now is really boring. And he goes, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have seen so many drawings that women do where they're on bed, curled in the fetal position, sucking their thumb, going, nobody loves me. And it's like, there's no story in that. I'm sorry. I understand you're 22 and we all go through that, but I want more. Yeah. <laughs> so the happy hour. I have covered some of this material in Life of the Party um, about playing at this in the gay bars of Orange County. But what I really wanted to do was a full circle coming of age uh, explanation of, of my love of comics and why I, and I couldn't do them in college. And so that's why I dropped out on the music, almost killed myself with drugs and alcohol. And then one day my muse came back to me and I decided to get back into art to do what I wanted to do. And that was comics. And so that's what it, but that was, you know, it took, I had to step away from everything and, you know, do what I wanted to do. <laughs> well, so it's always good to take a break sometimes, even with stuff you love doing, you know, because, yeah, you get a better perspective on it, I think, you know. Well, you, you just, can only bang your head against a wall for so long. <laughs> I mean, exactly. I mean, you, you said know, more directly and bluntly, but yeah, same, same yeah, thing. The, the Zago <laughs> thing went south. And, Nickelodeon and then I don't, didn't want to publish my stuff and no. I, I kind of I got sick of dealing with people mm -hmm. and I could see the the comic world was going to change but it hadn't changed quite yet this whole thing about we're gonna get in the bookstores we're gonna get in the bookstores and well it didn't happen it didn't yeah. happen and um and then I could see something happening so yeah. I thought yeah, yeah. So I thought I'd try doing a young adult book. And um, once again, I, I hit that 60% goal that I think I, I succeeded in that. But I think this book I'm doing now will be uh, what I was meant to do, pretty much. Okay. And um, I sent you the cover. and But I'm really having great fun with it because um, I'm, I'm testing my plagiarism skills. Um, I did this one panel where I passed out in church because we had to go to church every Sunday and in West Covina California it was like 100 degrees all the time 
And so I hallucinated once this whole thing of these uh, uh, characters from the uh, newspaper. <laughs> so I, I got to, uh, I have a, a issue of, <clears throat> 1947, the Herald Examiner. So I was able to, I had reference. Mm -hmm. So I was able to draw Lil Abner right. and then Mary Worth. <laughs> Mary Worth flipping out on Aston <laughs> here and Goofy. Goofy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I wonder how many copyright violations I, I'm doing here. And um, <laughs> and I was really obsessed with Daisy May because she was always crying. Um, like I was going, why doesn't Lil Abner love Daisy May? Why, why does he reject her? <laughs> So one day I went to my mom and I said, look, I drew Daisy May, look, you know, poorly. And my mom was just shocked. So she took an eraser and she started erasing the boobs. So you can see her, <laughs> she, you didn't see her boobs. And this is, so, this actually happened. This is a yes, real story. Oh, wow. <laughs> she goes, I don't want you drawing these things. I was like, well, mom, Thanks. you got to bust. No, but it, I mean, I'm eight or nine years old and I'm drawing Daisy May. My mom probably thought I was a dyke or something. They were always worried <laughs> I was going to be a tomboy or I was going to, I was listening to black music. You know, I was into blues and jazz. And so they were afraid I was going to date a black guy or something. <laughs> this fear from this wild child that I was, was, and I, I suppose I was, I mean, I read Catcher in the Rye when I was nine or 10 and, and I got it. Yeah. I mean, if you read the word goddamn for the 12th time, it doesn't mean any, it's not a bad word anymore, you know. Right. <laughs> so um, anyway, yeah, it's, so I just, it's going slow. I, I just try to do a little every day. If I only do a panel, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm, I don't have an editor. I wanted Gary Groth to be my editor, but yeah, forget it. He's too busy. Mm -hmm. And so I'll be laying in bed in the middle of the night going, oh, wait a minute. I didn't explain that enough so i have to renumber all the pages and insert another page in there but that's i'm trying to be my own editor on this you never know gary might come around as you get closer to being done you know <laughs> so well i sent him the first chapter and he was pleased because we have three sex scenes in the first chapter alone right. <laughs> so well i wanted to reel in my readers yeah yeah <laughs> so we did it that way yeah. and uh I don't know. I predict. I, I don't think you'll have a problem getting it done. I mean, getting it published once you get it done. You know, it just seems like something. I mean, from what oh. you just showed me, it's only a page and a half. You know, I'm like, where is it? I want it now. <laughs> you know, I was like, you know, it looks funny. I th I, you know, it looks interesting. You know, at the very least. Good, you know, good, so, good. So, well, once so. again, tell a common story and commonly well. And it's fanographics. I've already signed the contract. So. Oh, okay. So you are set up. Okay. All right. Yeah, it, it, it's funny. I. I've done a lot of work for Fanographics. It's it, I get along with Gary very well. Yeah. Um, uh, I know he's known as the uh, the terrible infant of the comic <laughs> world, and a lot of people despise him. But I don't know. We we seem to get along fine. We, we community. He's got a great sense of humor. Um, he's confided in me. I kind of have brother sister relationship in a weird way. I get along with him pretty well. I mean, the mo the most recent time I saw him was. I guess about five years ago, they did an EC show up here in Eugene, Oregon. And oh, really? He showed up because, you know, they're reprinting the ECs in the black and white hardbacks right now, their version oh. of the ECs. So, um, you know, he had a vested interest and he came down there. And we just started talking because he had recently, at the time, issued uh, Bill Shelley's uh, Kurtzman book. And, uh, you know, in, and I did a talk on Harvey Kurtzman. So, you know, he was there, and so, and we, we chatted, he knows I'm a huge Harvey guy, and, um, you know, he, you know, he, so he's always been very helpful and gracious to me, so it's like, but I can understand he has, like, a little harsher exterior to some, maybe, to put it like, but, you know, he's never really bothered me, <laughs> so. Well, you know, when you're in the art world, if you act too eager to please, people will walk all over you. Yeah, yeah. And it took me a long time to learn that. Yeah. And if somebody pisses you off, you've got every right to tell them they're an asshole. Yeah. And I yeah. and and what the first time you do it, it, the second time is really easy. Yeah. <laughs> it comes real natural. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but he hasn't given me grief. But I also didn't, you know, let him walk over, all over me either. So it's like, but you know, maybe I, I, you know, I wasn't trying to get him to publish anything of mine at the same time. But you know, so there's kind of this mutual respect going on for what I do. 
versus what he does. You know. Well, yeah, and that's the other, when you're a creator, it's a real tricky dance when you're talking to these publishers because there's so many people that want to be published and so, people, so many people that are, you know, really good and a lot of people are really bad, but sometimes really bad people have quite a bit to say. It, they're, um, the artwork is secondary. Uh, uh, a, a good example of that was uh, Glenn Head's Chartwell Manor book that just came out. Um, uh, there's some things he could improve on, but he doesn't have to because the story was just so great and so powerful. Have you heard about the book? I'm not sure, no. <laughs> well, well Glenn Head, he's a New York guy. He did Hotwire. Uh, yes, those, the, that. Three Hotwires for Fan Graphics. Mm -hmm. And so he did this autobiographical book about him going to this private boys school and it was run by this predator fiddler guy that, that sexually abused kids and hit them. And, and, uh, and since they were boys, a lot of them tell their parents and their parents, like, like Catholic priests molesting boys, the parents just, they, they can't accept it. So they say it never happened or they just push it aside. Oh, you have to go beyond this. Right. And so he, he relates his days going to school with this terrible person who was eventually arrested and sent to prison. And and one of the students fingered him, and they finally, you know, got justice. And then, and then Glenn's um, the 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 effects of all this, uh, you know, uh, over you know drinking too much, sex addiction, this kind of thing, doesn't go away with a lot of people that suffer abuse like that. So he's tackling some pretty heavy stuff, but the story has a happy ending because he has a child, and he has a daughter now, and and um, he's a pretty solid guy. He's uh, now that you explain it, I, I may have heard of it. I haven't read it, but uh, was it nominated for an Eisner or? Anything it like will that? be. It okay, will that's be. what it, you know because I hear these things because I I I vote on the Eisners every year, and uh, if I haven't read it, I I you know before I vote, I try to at least read about it and then read it afterwards because uh -huh. if you're nominated, you know that's still pretty darn good. You know, it just you know I for the most part. So. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, and you know another good book is you know what what uh, Backdurf did with the for, uh, the um, Kent State book. Mm -hmm. That I think that's probably that one, one of the most important know. graphic novels in the last twenty years because he's telling the truth. You know, here in California, we kind of heard oh there was a riot and the police got out of hand and they right. and they they shot at the wrong person. It wasn't like that at all. It got completely whitewashed about what really was going on. Yeah. So I was really grateful that he, he wrote the book so you could you know, learn the truth and how these people were murdered. They yeah. were systematically murdered. Yeah. Even, even yeah. they did a TV movie at some point, I think in the late seventies, early eighties. And it's like, mm -hmm. that really whitewashed the whole thing too. So, you know, <laughs> so. Yeah, well, yeah. they, you know, it's gotta be entertaining. So yeah. you put anything that makes you feel uncomfortable in the audience. Oh, right. God forbid. Right, right. <laughs> I hate movies. I don't like movies at all now. They're just so good crap. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me how you really feel. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, so once the happy hour is uh, done, are you pursuing other similar type projects? Maybe not the same subject, but I mean, just is, are graphic novels like your future calling or are you going to do more music or both or what, what, what? Where are well, you career-wise? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure because you know I'm only on page 40, and it's <laughs> going to be a 200-page book, so it's not going to be ready till 2023. Oh wow! Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, well, I, I don't know how fast you're working. <laughs> so how well, fast working are you working? <laughs> well, no, I'm working a lot slower than I did with Billy, uh, because during the when I started the book, I got involved in other things like uh, I wanted to do a little three-pager for Mine Shaft, so I did that uh, six months ago. And then Joyce Farmer, who did special exits and did tits and clips, the, the, uh, <laughs> the, feminist, the feminist comic. Yes. Um, she got together with a guy named Sandy Jimenez, who was involved with the World War III group. That's uh, Seth Tabachman Tabak and mm -hmm. Peter Cooper, which I think they've been doing this for 40 years, World War III. Yeah. And 
So Sandy was involved in that. So he's co-editing this book with Joyce on climate change. And it's called I Bet the Planet. Wow. <laughs> I, like I did a five page story for that. And she's trying to shop it around now using an agent up in Seattle uh, named Elizabeth Hayes. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to find a publisher. Um, it'd be nice if Abram was picked it up. Right. But that's not my call. Right. And uh, so that so that was good. And um, that's cool. It's cool because Slow Death came out too just a couple of months ago. Yeah, that one I did get. Yeah, that was terrific. The cover was great. Um, so I'm just focusing on this book now. I have no idea what I would do <laughs> afterwards. Um, I have no idea. Sounds like you work similar to me. You, you work on a lot of projects concurrently and then eventually one of them gets completed. Does that sound correct? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, like with, with Joyce's thing, I turned her down a couple of times and she goes, no, you have to be in this book. And I go, oh, all right. But I couldn't think of anything. Yeah. And they had categories for us to play with. And she said, well, we have religion versus science. And I went, what? <laughs> now you're talking. <laughs> Great. Now you're talking. Same thing with the Drawing Power book that Diane Newman did. I was going, I'm working on my, my graphic novel. I can't do this. Turned her down a couple of times. She goes, you've got to do something for mm. me. Because we, you know, Twisted Sisters, we did, and, and mm -hmm. Diane and I have always gotten along really well, and she's very inspiring, and I've been inspired by her work and Aileen Crum, mm -hmm. so I started thinking about something that happened to me many, many years ago, and I told a guy I knew a few years ago what happened to me. He treated me like a slut, mm -hmm. and I said, okay, now I got a story. Wow. now i got a story <laughs> so i did something for drawing power so while i've been working on happy hour i've been doing i mean when somebody begs you to be in a book like mm -hmm. twice yeah that's well, sort of it, you know it's, it's good, good to be feeling. wanted it's good to be in demand <laughs> <Yeah>. yes <laughs> um yeah. and it's good you have stories you can draw on and uh, unfortunately sometimes they're a little tragic i hate to say but they you know sometimes inspire the best stories so you know Exactly. Well, I hope so because I hated doing that drawing power story. I hated every second of it. <laughs> I no, I, I I cried while I was drawing it. I didn't think I thought I was I thought I dealt with all the what had happened to me. I basically was having an affair with this guy and he dosed me with a pill one night and raped me while I was passed. Now what a kinky guy. I mean, we were already using the wild thing. I mean, mm -hmm. but he had to make it even weirder. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I hadn't told my husband about this all the, the whole time we were married yeah. because I just didn't want to talk about it. But that's the whole idea of the Me Too movement. When you confide in people about things that happened to you, you're, you're, you're to blame. They, they started signing the blame onto you. And it happens to people all the time. What were you wearing? Yeah. Were you drinking? Yeah. Well, why did you go to his house? Right. <laughs> what were you thinking? Mm -hmm. Never, they, the, the perpetrators never held you know to any scrutiny it's the victim right and that's what that was about so so i said that's why i said ah okay now i got something to write about but it wasn't wasn't pleasant and yeah. uh and of course i had to change the names and the identities of all the people in the story because i don't want to get sued i do that a lot yeah. too mm -hmm. uh but this new book the happy hour there is some some parts where um just out of the blue, some guy called me up. He met a, a gal that I'd gone to school with and he wanted to, he heard I was playing bass, but I wasn't really good yet. I'd only been playing for about six months. And this guy just came over and took me under his wing and started teaching me. Hmm. And he, he wanted to have a band and he wanted me in it, but he, I had to get better. And of course I didn't get good quick enough and he had to go back to New York. Hmm. And I saw him one more time when we went to New York and, um, I have tried to find this guy on the internet to no avail because I would like to use his name to show him, you know, how what what the, he meant to me. But I had to change his last name because I don't know if he's dead or uh, the only the only clue I got. I finally found uh, his name was Don Manello, mm -hmm. and there was an article about Twisted Sisters with T. Snyder, and he was talking about a guitar player that he had played with called Don Manello. Huh. Well, that's a common Italian name. 
Anyway, I took a deep breath and emailed D. Snyder. Of course, you think he wrote me back? No way. Uh, Mr. Wolfgard, you know, Twisted Sister. Yeah, yeah. Which, of course, I think he stole that name from the comic book, too, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I asked Dave, Diane, when did that come out? Just like Love and Rockets, you know, the, right. the band. And right. that's what, you know, I know David J. Yeah. He used to live here in Encinitas, the guy from Bauhaus. And mm -hmm. then he went to, in Love and Rockets. Yeah, nice guy. Nice chap. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with you. You kind of wonder, it's like, where did they get that name? I'm sure. It well, I never just... told him about the Hernandez brothers and how they loathe Love and Rockets and made fun of them. Remember that one issue of Love and Rockets where they have the girls hanging out with those guys and they go, we're with the real Love and Rockets. It's a bunch <laughs> of flubby guys that are mm -hmm. just high school guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so on, on all your different work that you're talking about, past and present, do you have a particular way you draw, like, how, how do you uh you know, basically how do you draw do you use the same type of ink same type of pencils same type of paper or does it vary from project to project no i'm pretty stuck and I'm, I'm i'm kind of settled in my ways here um, okay i have these you know three uh, the, those binders those sketchbooks you get at michael's or aaron brothers <laughs> and um i uh i just pick up one i don't even you know if it's got a blank page i sketch out the idea and I just kind of divide the page into six panels. Just start there because it could be anywhere from a splash page to two panels to nine. It depends on, but, but when I'm writing, I don't write on a typewriter and I don't write longhand or anything. I write the, the thing at the top, you know, the verbiage at the top, mm -hmm. uh, try to write the, 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 the conversation and, and I'll use stick figures. I might just have a circle and a little arrow that says me. Because I want to save my drawing skills and my energy for the board. So all that preliminary sketching and everything, that's that's my writing. So that doesn't, that doesn't, I, I don't worry about the art. That'll come later. But I have it all in my mind. So I lay in bed and I can see this kind of movie in my mind of what I want to see. Mm -hmm. And so when I finally get the initial writing done to my satisfaction, then I get out my three-ply Bristol board. And um, for the happy hour, I've got a pile like this where it's all penciled out, you know, nine and a quarter by 11. And I like to work a little larger. Mm -hmm. And I take a piece of that uh, Strathmore board, is, I think it's 22 by 30. So I cut it in four pieces. So it's 11 by 15. Mm -hmm. So I get my money's worth. And then I start the penciling um, on the boards. Sometimes I like to pencil the whole chapter. Sometimes I'll just go page by page. But mostly what happens in my little sketchbook, what's page four will be up to page 12. Because I start thinking about all this other stuff that should go in there and pacing. And for me, the, the setting up a story is really important. I mean, you've got to, you can't, you've got to spoon feed people. You can't assume they know what, I mean, you really do have to dumb it down right. at first. And so when I get the pencils done, I make them fairly tight because I can't wing it with a brush and ink. I've tried. Oh. My favorite <laughs> art supply is correction fluid. Yeah. <laughs> and I use it liberally. No, on pencils, do you use a blue pencil or a standard? Oh, God, no, no, no. I use those, um, they're, they're these black pencils that were made famous by that architect uh guy who is that guy that um oh it's called twice twice the darkness half the pressure they're called um they got black erased what are they called oh. <laughs> i always ask this because you know there's magazines mm -hmm. like hogan's alley and other people that they're like what do they draw what do they, you know which which arm do you draw with you know whatever <laughs> you know <laughs> things like that <laughs> yeah, it's driving me crazy ah oh, here we go okay here. i call bolt Blackwing number Blackwing, yes. <laughs> so too the eraser sucks. Yeah. But for the penciling, they're they're fantastic and they're well, there are some uses. Yeah, yeah. I went to Comic Con one year and I gave these to all my favorite people like Peter Cooper and I go, You've got to try this pencil, it's really great. <laughs> and um so then I, I use uh repetigraph pens. I have you know the number one, two, two and a half, three, four, and then I have a uh Raphael, I used to use Windsor Newton number seven brushes, 
Yeah. But they're hard to find now, and the Raphaels look just as good sable. Yeah. Doesn't matter. And so I've tried to use the brush because you get that undulating line. Because I used to, <laughs> before I started using brush, I would take the rapidograph pen and I make two parallel lines and then I fill in the black. Oh, wow. And that's a real stiff look. And you can yeah. see in some of my stuff in Life of the Party where I did that, where I just, it, I went a little overboard. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I, I uh, use the um, brush. And then for the cross hatching, I like to use that number one rapidograph because it's a nice fine little, you know, little fine line. And then uh, very carefully take my white eraser <laughs> and break everything off. And um, a lot of the ink lifts up a little bit, but if you scan at 1200 DPI, you can correct so much because then when it shrinks down, it looks perfect. So that's when I can correct all, yeah, blow it like, a, like um, you know, like just a little a little spot like this i'll blow it up to the size of the screen right <laughs> and then you can you can you, you know that, that way you can find all the I, I get a little obsessive after a while like if there's circles i'll have to get out the pencil tool and make the circle perfect and everything yeah <laughs> so that's yeah so that's about it um um i don't like i i when i first got my computer in 96 i got a wacom tablet hated it okay so you're all manual which is fine yeah. Um, but color, color See, digital. Okay. <laughs> oh, what a gift. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because I used to back paint when you could get stats, which is transparencies with an emulsion layer on of black, yeah. not toner, but <laughs> like a photo, but clear. You you could back paint like an animation cell with cartoon color uh, cell vinyl paints. Right. So that's what I did for years. And it was really great because then you had a nice piece of art you could sell mm -hmm. and that's all gone. Cartoon colors out of business. You can't get stats anymore. I have uh, the Fleener cover. I'm looking at it right now. That was back painted and I've got one cover of Slutburger. I, I think maybe three pieces left. Wow. <laughs> uh, this uh, obsolete form of coloring. Yeah. So for me, getting on Photoshop, what used to take me four to six hours to do, I can do in like a half an hour. Cool. I mean, it's yeah. just it's just wonderful, and I and I do have a, a formula for color. Uh, when I squint my eyes, the red is dark and the yellow is light. So I always start with yellow and red in areas around, and then I try to put an opposite next to those colors. Mm -hmm. And then when I kind of get, because I love those old psychedelic posters like that Moscoso used to do and John Hammersmith, Hammersmith. He did that Jimi Hendrix one, the famous, famous Jimi Hendrix psychedelic poster with the hair, mm -hmm. Hammersfeld or whatever. I, I know uh, which one you're talking about. Yeah, I, don't know. I love opposite colors when they get that zzz effect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> messes with your eye. And then, then I'll start adding colors like maybe grays or maybe some tans, just a little bit in there to make it richer. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I try to keep uh, the fonts to a, a, a minimum because it drives me crazy when you open up the newspaper, look at the comic strips, everybody's got a freaking font, a split font, you know, a gradation <laughs> in every strip. They're using it in place of a background mm -hmm. and it's cheating and it's, it's lazy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and my God, if I see one more digital illustration of that hideous magenta that everybody insists on using that oversaturated magenta I hate, <laughs> hate that color it's just it's very difficult to use purple is another hard color to use it comes across as gray if you're not careful robert williams talks about that in his movie mr bitchin hmm. a purple's a, 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 a weird color yeah. have you seen mr bitchin the, the robert no. williams i didn't even see a lot of stuff <laughs> i'm missing out well, okay probably at the library yeah. Well, it's amazing what the libraries have in, in terms of movies it's great mm -hmm. so that's my that's my that's my secret can you draw with your right hand i see you pulling up your right hand so are you right but I, okay my right hand but i reach for things with my left hand so i suspect when i was younger they correct <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, a lefty. I do I'm a lefty but i always ask people if they draw with the right or left hand because you never think about that you know when you when you see finished art you know how did they do that and that's what 
that's why I asked that because, you know, as an artist myself, I just kind of curious of techniques and things like that. And I'm sure other people watching this would kind of be interested in how you work. So, you know, that's why I have those questions. Well, well, a lot of really, I would say the majority of really creative people are left-handed, I've noticed in the comic business. Yeah. Um, it, it's not unusual. In fact, it's, it's fairly common. But when I do ceramics, because I do pottery too, you have mm -hmm. to be able to use, you know, you're throwing a pot, you're going up like this. You have to be, able, you can't be sort of am I, you know, amb ambidextrous. Yeah, well, I'm kind of ambidextrous too. I mean, it's not well, like I, do it. I mean, I actually could draw with my right hand if I had to, you know, it's, and really? it looks decent. I can write with my right hand, but it looks what? better with my left hand. So it's like, so uh, I don't do it very often, but I always think, well, if I ever have a strokers, or lose my arm. <laughs> Big silly. Yeah, you put that pencil in your mouth. Or, ah, ah, ah. There, not there. there we go. Hey, you missed a spot. That's my new career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, I don't have any other questions right at the moment. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Do you have uh, anything? I always have the guest at the end of the show just kind of you've already talked about your upcoming projects but you know if you're doing any shows or how they can get a hold of you or if you have anything for sale or anything like that so go ahead website okay well i have a website which is pretty much a, a brag sheet um i uh it's www.maryfleener.com mm -hmm. and i have on there my black velvet work which is like right behind me is a black velvet painting <laughs> as you can see which i love i like doing yes. campy stuff on black velvet this one's called our lady of oodle sway off way oodle spay which means <laughs> oodles of poodles in pig lap <laughs> oodles of poodles and, and 48 by 60 inches it's a huge canvas mm. so i have a page of those and then i have a page of the cover the covers that i've done for comics because i love doing covers um yeah. Uh, when Craig Yo asked me to do the variant for a Popeye cover yeah, for DW, yeah. I well the first I did I gave him they didn't like it. I go no, please give me another chance, give me another chance because <laughs> I got to do this because and of course it's work for hire because I don't own Popeye, yeah. but it was that was fun to do. But I I like I, that I, series and so I I did buy your variant and everything else you know at the time so I have it in my collection somewhere. But, well, there's a collection now of all the covers. Yeah, I guess. They decided to put out which that would be something i'd like to see but i i really screwed up you know what i left out of the drawing i didn't put his pipe in his mouth <laughs> <laughs> look at it again i i i i i was I debating whether i should have him smoke the pipe because you know smoking and all this mm -hmm. stuff and and i just got into the design and i was in a hurry because when craig said well you got a week to do this if you want to do it so i was just you know jamming away so anyway and then i have paintings on there that I've done that's a series of, of scary goddess paintings which I'm trying to make um, they're real hard-hitting paintings they're not something you'd see in the library uh, they're, they're statements on the human condition stuff like our lady of perpetual litigation our lady of conjoint <laughs> celebrity our lady of organized vituperation which is my statement on religion mm -hmm. and I'm asking a lot of money for those because mm -hmm. I want I was my goal was to do 30 of them. I only have eight of them right now, but some of them took a whole year to do. And I'm working on acrylic on canvas. Yeah. And um, so it's, you can see, and then there's a little interview that somebody did with me. I'm not really interested in selling art right now. I've, I've sold enough that I've given away. Mm -hmm. And I've decided now if, if somebody wants one of my comic pages, I'm going to ask a lot of money yeah like five hundred dollars yeah because uh i've been doing this long enough to do that i i didn't feel i'd had the right to do that before but um like like the billy the bee pages i don't even want to sell i put so much work into those i, I want to keep them for to show in galleries and kim munson had a couple of shows in italy this year that uh, featured women cartoonists and i had a couple of pages in that for that and they got um, they made it all the way back, you know, so she's, and she's great. And um, I tell you one thing, when I do get this book back, I, okay, we'll go back to that question. 
I want to get back into pottery because I have a potter's wheel, I have a kiln, and um, I like to make functional objects like pot, you know, uh, vases and things like that. And I draw into the clay body with a pencil in my cubistic style. Cool. And then I just rub iron oxide on it and just glaze the inside of the pot. Mm -hmm. And there's a good reason for that because glaze, if it runs down on the bottom of the pot, it will ruin your kiln shelves. It costs 75 bucks each mm -hmm. and you don't want that. <laughs> yeah. It ruins the pot. In glaze, when it's fired and it's cool, it's like glass. It's real, real sharp. You can cut yourself really easily. And I've sold hundreds of these pottery pieces. People just mm -hmm. love them because mm -hmm. they're they're uh, archival. I mean, it's fired at twenty one hundred degrees. That pottery is going to be around for five hundred years. It's never going to break down. Mm -hmm. So that's I'm kind of looking forward to get back back into clay because mm -hmm. it's very relaxing and I love I like working with it. Mm -hmm. And aside from that, just you know, practicing my drums and mm -hmm. and uh, you know, hopefully, maybe in a couple of you know, when I start learning instruments, it's like learning cartooning. It, you won't be really good. Some people take to it right away. Yeah. I say most people give yourself three to five years. So maybe in two more years, I'll be gig worthy. I can hold my own in a jam right now. Yeah, but I'm not. It's not second nature to me like bass guitar. Yeah. Yeah, so you so, want to so be second nature. I get it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, you have to, you know, because when you get on stage, there's all sorts of, you know, after playing in bars and stuff, you, you, you know, you, there's a lot to deal with when you go into a place where there's alcohol and drunk people, and you got to entertain. <laughs> the, you can't be too. You got to, you got to keep that wall up, yeah. and be be professional, mm -hmm. because I've had instances where people pulled knives on me and. And I had to clock them with my bass. And I've had instances where I had to take my instrument off and go to the bartender and say, kick this guy out or we're leaving. Hmm. Okay, you get pretty hairy. You see, there's two sides to me. There's the comic side and the art side where I was like, please love me, love me, love me. But then when I get that instrument on me, I turn into the bar bitch. Yeah. I, I, I feel it. I can feel my personality change. It's the damnedest thing. Yeah. You know, but well, I mean, I've seen it with like Pete Townsend and with Keith Richards, it's like once, you know, once they're playing, you know, this is my territory, this is my turf, stay away from me, or I'll bat you with my guitar, you know. Oh my God, have you ever seen that clip of Keith clocking that guy? Jagger's doing satisfaction, he's wearing the flag. Oh, and yeah. That guy comes up and he just goes, oh, boom. Yeah, yeah, he talks about it. Yeah, he's like, hey, you don't come around my singer. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know? Boy, boy, boy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Keith. I I um, I love uh, Talk is Cheap, his first solo album. Oh, yeah. He's the only only Stone that ever made a good solo album. Bill Wyman, eh. <laughs> Dagger, let's just forget he did that. <laughs> yeah, now Keith's great. He's my he's a great guy, great chap. I would like yes. to meet him someday, but I probably won't. Yeah. You ever met him? I have not met him. The only Stone I've ever met in person. I've seen the Stones in concert, but the only one I met sure. in person is Ron Wood. Because he did oh. back in the '90s, he did an art book himself. Because he's a yeah, painter. he's a great yeah. artist. And yeah. you know, it was a bookstore signing, and he signed his name with the big nose. You know, <laughs> you know, Ron Wood, and he just put a little caricature of himself with a big nose. You know, I thought perfect. You know, um, and uh, if you haven't listened to it, you know, it's uh, Keith Richards' uh, autobiography, the audio version called Life. You know, yes, his, read the book. You know, if you if you listen to the audio version, he has Johnny Depp read part of it, but he has this Irish guy read part of it. And it, it's just really entertaining. And, it, you know, yeah. so, you know, it's worth seeking out to listen to, even if you've already read it, you know, because it's just a very entertaining listen. So <laughs> I recommend the audio book. So. <laughs> yeah, and Keith, and Keith does an introduction himself. So you get to hear. He it. does. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. So. Well, I'm going to check yeah. that out. I would. <laughs> I so, read it through really quickly because I wanted to, you know, I was just devouring it. I usually yeah. have to read books twice. I, I always want to see what happens at the end and then I have to reread it. Right, you know, right. To, yeah. To, but to I mean, the good parts. I, I, I didn't dislike Keith, but it made me appreciate him a lot more because for some reason, especially when I first became a fan, it was back in the 70s, I just saw it was Mick Jagger and whoever was in the room. And of course, that was around the time Keith Richards was having his drug problems. So he yeah. wasn't being very, uh helpful with the band much anyway you know yeah. i think he yeah, had to do some special gigs to keep out of jail and things like that so yeah. you know 
Uh, but you know, now he's more productive and you know, he's done the solo albums and stuff like that. And uh, you know, so yeah, I appreciate him a lot more. I'm glad he's still around. You know, we, we just lost Charlie, but you know, it happens, you know, we all you know eventually. But um I don't know where we're going with this. I was just asking you to promote. So the last yeah, question, I guess, we're is um, <laughs> face that we're groupies. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> all right, yeah, all right. um, so you're not doing the San Diego show this year, but do you think you'll do it no. in 2022 or uh, is that sound soon enough or you're not sure or any show? Nothing. No, I mean, Nothing planned. That's fine because, you know, I, I ask people all the time and it's funny. I, I started this podcast in 2018. And you know, it's that times before the pandemic, and everybody's like, Yeah, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, blah, 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 blah. and then it's funny when well, I was gonna do this show and this show and this show, but now they're all canceled, and I don't know. And then I, I got to the point where I stopped asking people, you know, just saying, What are you doing yeah. while you're not because I knew, but now it's kind of like some people go out, other people don't, you know, it's like you know, it's it's kind of an interesting transitionary time now, you know, to see where things go. I, you know, for me, I'm fully vaccinated and just got the booster. So I'm like, not like Damn I'm going to go run out to the big crowd and, you know, no. you know, do uh, what's it called? Lollapalooza or one of those shows, oh, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, summer break or spring break or whatever. But, you know, at the same time, you know, I, I don't feel uncomfortable like going to a restaurant or something now, things like that, you know. Whereas well, probably with the Comic Con this year was that Thanksgiving weekend. Yeah. Um, with the borders have been opened in Mexico and Canada. Yeah. And we are about half an hour from Tijuana. Oh yeah. And every weekend, the family, you know, people it starts on Friday where people from Mexico are either going down to Mexico, see families, or they're coming up here. And yeah. then Sunday, it's like gridlock on the freeways. And Thanksgiving will be a nightmare well i don't I mind could, you i don't blame you for being cautious right now anyway so yeah. You know. <laughs> well the other factor is just driving down there it would take me i mean i've been stuck in traffic trying to get to downtown san diego it would take me like an hour and a half two hours yeah. and then there's a train you can take but unfortunately in del mar the cliffs are falling <laughs> and i'm not going to set on foot on that train and go go by that i mean you can you can look right down you can see right down at the yeah. surf and it's hairy and now the cliffs are eroding i think the tracks are 12 feet from the edge now i ain't getting on that train wow. no way no way <laughs> and uh so and then you know uh i was thinking maybe going to see my mom because you know she's 99 now she's gonna be 100 on january 1st so uh <laughs> I, I think I might go a day or two before and then, you know, wait a little bit, but no, it was out of the question to, to do that. I, I, yeah. uh, I know Mimi Pond and uh, Scott Shaw, Scott Saw, I mean, no, Scott Shaw, <laughs> exclamation point, they're going and yeah. Last Gasp isn't going to be there. And I don't know if Fanographics is going. So um, I know they, they wanted to, you know, people, the, you know, people wanted to do something. And Comic Fest, which is that little smaller version, right? I think that might happen next year. Usually, is Feb. Yeah, that's when we all. The last time we all got together in the comic thing here in San Diego was March eighth of two thousand of twenty twenty. Wow! <laughs> and so we all went out to up. dinner, and there was nobody in the restaurants in Kearney Mesa. Wow. So that and and we were all and everybody was washing their hands and everything and couple thousand people and nobody got sick so that was the good news but that was the last time we saw you know trina and, and jackie estrada um will stout um but, uh, bill sent sent kivitz anyway the peenies were there the yeah. elk quest people it was yeah. a big variety and it's a really neat little uh, thing the comic fest because it's small and you can actually talk to people and it's not right. like the, you know the background for the you know, Marvel DC with their boom, boom, boom. Yeah, boom, yeah. Boom. I've been meaning to go to that one, but I moved to Oregon six years ago. Now I probably I'm thinking about moving back to California again, probably in the middle of the state somewhere. So that'll free me up that I could actually make it down to San Diego because right now it takes like I don't know, 15, 20 hours or something. It's like, bah, you know. Are you near Bend? 
Bend uh, or? West of Bend. I'm in the exact, if you threw a dart and hit right bullseye, I know, I heard that's that. where Eugene Springfield, I'm in the uh, Simpsons Springfield. So it's like, yeah, I have the grainy okay. connection here. So. <laughs> Well, that's yeah. why our drummer moved. He moved to Ben because he's a young guy and he wanted to, you know, start, you know, get a. Yeah. Do something I went different. to. I went, this is an aside, but I went to Ben about two months ago, and they had the very last blockbuster video, and there's even a movie about that. So um, it's really operating. Owned, you know, it's still owned and operated by uh, who owns Blockbuster Video. It's the final, only one open and. You know, they don't know how long it'll last, but that's the last one. Yeah, there oh were some God. in Alaska and they closed. There's some in Australia <laughs> and they closed. So the, the last ones in Bend, Oregon. It's funny. Holy cow. And it's it's like time machine because it's looks it looks the same as they always did, except it has the current movies out. So that's the only yeah. difference, you know, but they still have a lot of older movies, you know, on the shelves and stuff. But they still the only difference is if you see the documentary. Uh, since they're not supplied by the, the corporate owner anymore, she has to yep. go and buy her own treats like at uh, Walmart <laughs> or Costco, you know, <laughs> to or... sell, to resell to people who come to Blockbuster. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. <laughs> oh, I wanted to ask you, yes. did, have you seen that movie about Bill Wyman called The, the uh, Stone Alone or something like that? No, I didn't know there was one about him. The, the most recent one I've seen is uh, the one that was about the death of Brian Jones. So I'm watching oh. a lot of Stone stuff now, so I'll have to look that one up. So I'm definitely interested. So. <laughs> well, they talk about how he's, he's an archivist. He, he saved every file. Oh, I knew that. I knew that. Every yeah. article. I mean, it's incredible. I'm so happy he did that. And he, and you know, yeah, I, I could say a final thing. I, I would encourage everybody, and, and you're not being an egotist by doing this. Um, I started 20 years ago, a scrapbook for my dad yeah. and to, to show him what I've been doing. And so I cut out every article, every interview, pictures, everything. And that yeah. sucker is about this thick right now. Yeah. And I'm so glad I did that. Yep. because um uh, you know and of course i've got a pile of stuff where i've got to glue it in there and they don't make these scrapbooks anymore everything's you know it's, everything's thinner and stuff but it was the old-fashioned one where you could put the extenders in there and screw yep. them together and um i think everybody should do that I mean, if anyone's listening to this think about that because yep. you know if you're a musician you make cds and you you record your practices and your rehearsals and things like that and and I think cartoonists and artists really owe it to themselves to uh, archive the the press they get because yep. nobody's going to do it for you. I and, try to keep a copy, at least one copy of every article that has been published of mine, mainly good. Back Issue magazine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have copies of every fanzine I've ever published, I have copies of every book I've ever published you know, or written and stuff like that. So at least I get, get that. I don't get much press unfortunately i mean i get a lot of passing mention on internet i guess i can print stuff out and just hold on to it but <laughs> you know it's like uh but i did get mentioned in the new york times about a week ago david DePatty passed away and the guy uh, who was doing the obituary called me up and asked me a few questions because i wrote a pink panther book a few years ago and uh -huh. uh, so I'm, i've been in the new york times <laughs> Yeah, well, so, make sure you get everything in, in plastic bags. Yeah, so I did have to go out and buy a copy. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> no, you, that's good. That's good. I'm getting there. Yeah. In the meantime, yeah, I'm doing these podcasts and, you know, I keep copies, backup copies in case YouTube or uh, automatic takes a, a bust. At least I have copies of it and everything like that. And, you know, I keep it out there free of charge because I know people want to hear from you and you know i've interviewed peter bag i'm you mentioned trina i'm going to interview her in about a week or two and uh so i'm trying to make my rounds uh talking to various people in the comic book world of course the music world of course the animation world so you know it's been fun yeah no it's, it's fantastic I, I really look forward to read uh, hearing the other interviews you did and uh pete i just i picked up a uh, used uh collection of the hate the complete mm -hmm. one two and three books Mm -hmm. And I'd only bought maybe six of the copies of Hate. And boy, the first two, it is, I, I never realized what a good writer Pete was. Yeah. I mean, I want to write him a fan letter, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want it to go to his head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
also that book he did about Zora Neale Hurston. I thought I was a big expert on Zora Neale Hurston and that book he did fire mm. out of this world. It's mm. really, really good. Yeah. And he, he does his drawing style, but it's not the, the lunatic, you know, like Buddy Bradley kind right. of stuff. It's still, you can tell it's Pete. Right. And yeah, he really, he, he really did well with that. I was very impressed. Yeah. So, so if you go to the archives, there's an episode with him. Yeah. Oh, good. About, good. You know, there's so, yeah, just take a look. But um, uh, if there's nothing else, uh, I don't have any other questions, but it was a pleasure having you on the show, Mary. And you may know. I recommend one person that you should interview? Sure. Okay. Okay. And then I'll, and I'll shut up. Oh, uh, cool. There's a guitar player that plays with Todd Rundgren named Jesse Gress. Jesse Gress. And, Jesse G R E S S, and if you go on Facebook, there's a page called Jesse Grass is a King, mm -hmm. <laughs> and he I met him when I did um, the the Cucamongas, and I had the little character the Zodiac Tiki guy playing a flute, and I had some sheet music on there, and I said when this was a contest, can you name the song? And he wrote me, and he guessed it was Hawaiian War Chant. He was. Turns <laughs> out he did all the charts for Guitar Player Magazine for popular songs and wow. musician, and he plays with Todd Rundgren. Oh, wow. I did the cover for his book, The Guitar Cookbook, and he did two of them, and I was lucky enough to do number one. Anyway, this guy had a lung transplant this year. He had pneumonia, and he's back on stage playing. Wow. It's a, he, and he, great guy, really interesting. Um, I, I would like to hear his whole story because he's, uh, I've seen him twice here locally at the Belly Up when he played with Rundgren, and he's, you know, Rundgren's lucky to have him. Let's put it that way. So if you go to YouTube, he's all over the place and he's all over Facebook. So yeah, I wrote him down while we were talking here. So Good. I will I will look him up. <laughs> all right. Well, Mark, it's been a pleasure. All right. I thank you very much. Okay. And uh, this concludes another episode of the Fun Ideas Podcast. And join us next time. Thank you. Have a great day.